steering. And we are recording this webinar, and that means that you will be able to go into the Google's web page after the webinar and listen to this again, or you can pass that link to any colleague that could not be part of this live meeting. So my name is Torsten Tanner. I'm co-chairing the Google Steering Committee. I'm sitting in Germany, in, in Kiel, at Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research. Today, we have a webinar in the, in the Google's webinar series. Uh, that we try to keep on a regular frequency, like once a month or so. And today we're going to hear about the value chains in public marine data. That is based on a recently published report that has been uh, committed by MEDIN, which is the UK Marine Environment Data and Information Network. And from MEDIN, we have Claire Postle White that represents MEDIN. And it's uh, hosted by the Ocean Economy Group of OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And we have Claire Jolly, who is the head of that unit here. And by GOOS, the Global Ocean Observing System, as you will know, and represented by Emma Heslop from the GOOS office. Some, um, housekeeping rules as you know that's going to be recorded we have no way of letting you mutually or, or, or orally ask questions so please put your questions in the q a box and i will uh, pass those questions on to the panelists after the presentations uh, for other communication in terms of uh, taking issues and so forth use the chat box pass questions to the to the panelists in the q a box so we will now hear three Swatch speeches covering roughly half an hour, and then we end half an hour to uh, take Q and A's. So I will ask now, Claire Jolly, my pleasure to have you here from OECD to give an overview of, of the report. Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Dorste. Thank you uh, also everyone uh, joining us today for this special webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this, uh, especially with my colleague Emma and Claire. Um, so we're in very good company today. Uh, and uh, thanks all, in particular to our colleagues from Goose for hosting uh, the webinar today. So I will share with you just a, a brief introduction to the work that we produced jointly um, and uh, give you some background on why the OECD is particularly interested in marine data. There we go. So as many of you uh, probably know, the OECD is an international economic organization. And I had the STI Ocean Economy Group within the Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation, where we analyze the economics, the science and innovation potentials linked to, to the ocean. Our tasks are to identify in particular the steps that should be taken uh, by policymakers to make our growing ocean economy more sustainable uh, while managing better climate change and prevent further biodiversity loss. This is, of course, a big task. Uh, but here we really aim to create evidence to support the decisions. So this work um, on the ocean economy and innovation is particularly supported by a number of organizations from ocean champions, uh, like the US with NOAA, Canada, Korea, Portugal, Ireland, Norway, Italy, Belgium, Flanders. And, and I see actually some of uh, uh, the stakeholders are joining us today. Uh, so this work on marine data that we will share with you now is really part of this broader research agenda. Public marine data are for us key resource for knowing about the marine environment, for safety, for research, for economic development. We are talking about complex systems that are funded by taxpayers' money from in-situ buoys to large and small research vessels, satellite data, and other data collecting exercises. In parallel, reliable and sustainable data management and archiving systems need to be put in place. So as for any publicly funded systems, assessments on the costs and benefits of collecting, distributing, and archiving the data necessary. Such evaluations provide decision makers with the evidence 
they require to guide future investments. But this is far from being easy, obviously, as it was recognized in particular during the Ocean Ops 2019 conference, um, the once every decade, the conference of the ocean observing community. Making thorough assessments is challenging and requires new and multidisciplinary approaches. And that's really where the OECD comes in uh, and hopefully can help. So really the overall objective of this OECD work on marine data. It's building on years of research on, and analysis um, on the digital economy uh, and on data from other sectors. We have established uh, since then a close collaboration with different marine data expert communities and we hope actually to even broaden this cooperation with the objective to develop again original evidence for decision makers. To do this, we have a number of activities that are summarized here. Uh, we started this work already uh, um, three, four years ago, um, and for which we produced already quite a number of papers. We have had particularly good cooperation with our colleagues from GUS. I really have to highlight this. Um, as key stakeholders in the ocean observing community and uh, our colleagues from NOAA in the US. Today, you will hear particularly about the findings from one activity uh, we are uh, leading and developing really, I would say, further evidence uh, on a joint basis on value chains uh, in marine data. And we believe it's very exciting, I have to say. Um, since we launched, uh, uh, a first case study uh, just a year and a half ago, I would say. Uh, this, is, this came with support from our colleagues from GUS, but uh, also from our colleagues from the UK Marine Environmental Data and Information Network, MEDIN. You will hear from uh, Claire Postelwaite in just a few minutes. And here, because I really, really have to thank MEDIN and its partnering data archive centers, the DAX. And I know some of uh, the participating uh, colleagues in the audience today are from the DAX. Um, this is really uh, the result, this case study, of this close collaboration. Um, without their involvement, this case study would not have worked, simply because, thanks to them, we were able to really survey directly some of their data users. And, and I hope they, they, they see how much it was worth their time in the end. Uh, we built together an original survey and here also let me recognize uh, the role of James Jolliffe, who's a colleague in the OECD. He's not presenting today, but he was really instrumental uh, as an economist and as a data scientist. So I just wanted to say a, a, a good hi, hello to uh, our colleagues, James here. So from the start, this original survey was built to provoke responses that would help us build later on value chains. So it, that's why it's a really an original survey, I would say, and it worked. A value chain maps the relationship between data production, processing, generation of data products, and the usage by different user groups. That's a very general definition. This allowed us for the first time to track the types of data that user, users were accessing, all the way to the information and actions that they were taking in a given sector based on that initial data. Claire and Emma will go in more details about the findings in the next two presentations. But let me tell you, it was very exciting, uh, particularly in the OECD Secretariat, to discover, to discover that the case study was really working with different value chains appearing uh, that sometimes we did not really expect. The importance of the offshore wind sector in the UK, for example, as a marine data user was, for instance, quite nice to document. So the good news is that we have now proven a concept, I believe, and although more work is needed on the economic valuation um, paths, part, I would say, which is also very exciting and ongoing, um, we uh, intend to launch more case studies in different parts of the world. Uh, we know a number of countries and organizations are interested, uh, but we are very happy to have more and have this discussion with some, some of you. So our objective at the OECD is to build up more evidence, and this is just the start for marine data. So without further ado, I will stop here and let uh, uh, my colleagues present uh, the, the rest of the findings. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Claire and uh, I now give the floor to Claire Prostler White to talk a short presentation uh, from the Medin side of things, I guess. And um, 
I remind you all to write your questions in the Q&A box and we will take all the questions to all three speakers by the end of the presentations. There. Thank you, Tasta. Thank you, Claire. So my name is Claire Postlethwaite. I'm the coordinator of MEDIN, the Marine Environmental Data and Information Network. MEDIN is an open partnership of UK organisations who share an interest in making marine data open and easily accessible. So for the past 18 months, MEDIN has been collaborating with our colleagues at OECD and Goose uh, to explore the value chains in public marine data, as we've just heard from Claire, and we've been using the UK as a case study for this work. This has culminated in the publication of a paper that Claire has mentioned, and I've got the, the link up on the slide, and you'll also see it in the, the chat. So hopefully you can, if you haven't already had a chance to look at it, you can do so. I'll start off with a little bit of an introduction to MEDIN. MEDIN provides the national framework for managing marine data in the UK. We provide tools and resources to make marine data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We're funded through a consortium of sponsors and their logos are shown on the screen. And they range from government departments to um, private organizations. The focus for today's work, the focus of the national framework is the data centers, the accredited organizations that provide long-term access to marine data across, across a wide variety of marine data types, as, as Claire and Emma mentioned earlier. So, if from the Goose community, we're talking about broader than the essential ocean variables. We're talking about underwater archaeology. We're talking about geology and geophysics. We're talking about bathymetry, species and habitats. So MEDIN encompasses a really broad range of marine data. So it's worth keeping that in mind as we go through looking at the results um, today. So what did we do with this ex exciting work that we've been carried out over the past 18 months? Well, as Claire mentioned, we carried out an original survey of the users of the MEDIN data archive centres. This, these, the survey was made live from the, the data centre's websites, and um, so we were really trying to capture the data users at the point where they were accessing data from public repositories. We received 191 high quality responses to the survey, and by high quality I mean complete and with extra um, contextual narrative provided with the, the responses. So they were really um, very valuable responses, and so thank you to any of you on the call who did respond to, to that survey. The focus of the survey was on the data flow in the economy and looking at um, to build up value chains. The responses to the survey were mainly from the UK, but there were responses from 20 different countries. So that really shows that um, the global extent of, of use of data from UK data centres. And that's something to, to keep in mind as well. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about who we found is using marine data and what data they're um, actually accessing. And then Emma in, in her presentation will talk more about the, what is being done with that data. Okay, so we'll start off with the who. So this is the, the sectors that the respondents to the survey work in. You can see there's 50% of the respondents work in academia, 14% in the policy sector, 12% are consultants, and a further, oh, I can't see, I'm covered up, 9% um, in uh, other commercial industries. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us there's definitely a significant value chain that uses that encompasses the academic sector. And it tells us that we are reaching all of the sectors that we thought were our user group. So that, that's really reassuring for, for Medin. At this point though, I will introduce my caveat. This is a self-selected sample of our users. People had to opt to take the survey. So it's not a random sample of our users. So just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the results. The question that this breakdown of, of the respondents does raise is whether these differences um, in the sectoral uptake of or use of the data, if that is a genuine reflection, does that highlight potential areas for growth in, in where um, other sectors could potentially be using data more, uh, marine data more? Okay, so still thinking about who's using the data. We now we asked, what is your occupation? If you're using marine data, what's your occupation? And you can see there's a, a nice long list there of different occupations, but 
see they're mainly scientists. So all of the occupations there in red are some form of scientists. But as well as that, we do see substantial numbers from other economies, archaeologists, information specialists, engineers, and so on. We also asked what industry our users work in or with, and recognising that that can be more than one industry. And again, you can see we've got a significantly long list. So we have a broad range of industries that are accessing uh, and using marine data. Perhaps not surprising, considering the previous results we just thought about, that scientific research and development is, is top of the list. But we also see really significant use from some burgeoning ocean economies, such as the offshore wind and renew, marine renewable energy sectors. And that's really um, interesting, considering how uh, how significant that industry has been in the UK um, in the past, uh, past uh, decade. So now moving on to what data are being used. I promise this is the final bar chart. Um, what we see here is a range of marine data are being used, which is again reassuring when we consider the range of data that's being made available through MEDIN. So we are seeing that um, all that, those different types of data are being accessed. We see that physical oceanography data is, is top of the list um, and it's really uh, quite considerably uh, higher than the, the other data types. At first, when I first saw this, I have to confess, I wondered whether we did have some very diligent physical oceanographers uh, responding to the surveys, but as we'll see in Emma's presentation, physical oceanography data is being used across the sectors. It really is a very valuable um, resource. And of course that makes sense. Um, first of all, physical oceanography data has historically been collected for a very long time. It's, it's perhaps easier to collect than some of the other um, types of data, but also it underpins physical oceanography data, the temperature, the salinity, the currents, that underpins um, our understanding of all the other parameters in the oceans. Um, just to point out here that although this, um, these are categories of data types that we've uh, plotted uh, on the bar chart, we did collect the information at a finer granularity. So we could go into the, the information that was collected in the survey and see that actually in the physical oceanography data, temperature and salinity was most frequently used, followed by currents, followed by sea level, and so on. Okay, just starting to wrap up now. The, just wanted to talk about some insights that this work has brought for the data centers and for data networks like MEDIN. The first is that we really have now robust evidence of who is using what marine data and why they want it, what they're going to do with it. So this is really essential information for, for data centers so that they can understand their users and how they need to develop to make, meet their users' needs. Some of the recommendations in the paper are specifically targeted at data centers and one of these is to do with newer technologies i won't say new technologies because they've been around for a while and if we look at the the pie chart this shows uh, why um, users were visiting the data center and that was to download raw data to search for data to download data products such as maps and charts or to link to data. So 13% of the, the users were linking to data using technologies such as APIs, application programming interfaces, or web map services. Um, and so this is machine to machine links to data. And this is an area that has a real potential for growth. Um, and it's, it's an area that the data centers should be um, keeping an eye on and, and developing. We met, I mentioned earlier some areas for growth and supporting certain sectors to um, make easier use of, of marine data. Another recommendation from the paper is to develop for the data centers to develop communication strategies which clearly outline how the marine data are used and reused for such a wide variety of purposes throughout the ocean economy and beyond. And then the final recommendation for the data centers was and for data networks is around tracking users. So we have seen through this work how valuable um, it is to build up a real uh, picture of who is using the data and what they're doing with it. But MEDIN uh, has, to date, has really stepped away from um, tracking our users. We've deliberately uh, avoided 
any registration for access to use because we wanted to make it as easy as possible for users to access data. So there's a recommendation in the paper that we explore ways to track users without compromising that easy access to the data. So just to finish off, I'd like to thank all the Medin Data Archive Centres, particularly those who uh, participated in the survey and, and supported the survey. I'd like to thank DEFRA who funded Medin's involvement in, in the project, and of course my colleagues from OECD and Goose. And finally, I want to leave you with this image, which is hot off the press, and um, just, just giving you a little taste of how exciting, how excited I am about this at the moment. Um, so this is a figure that shows how for each type of data, so in this example, it's ocean current data, how it's being used. So I think this is a really valuable communication tool that we can take forward for the data centers for all the different types of data that's being used. And it's a real, um, can demonstrate the impact that specific data types have. So I shall stop now and hand over to Emma. Thank you very much, Claire. This is an impressive draft. It takes some time to, to look through. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there are going to be questions about that. So I remind you to the audience, please put your questions to the panelists in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. And now we will hear the last presentation from Emma Heslop, and then we will take questions. Emma, it's all yours. We do see the presentation, um, your presenter mode rather than the presentation mode on the screen. That's better. Thank you. But we cannot hear you. I'm following on and that will be the last presentation for today so that we can get on to the, the questions. And uh, I'm just going to introduce perhaps a little bit what Goose's interest in working with Medin and the OECD is. Um, we've now been working with the OECD for, for a number of years. And I think it's uh, uh, looking at sort of what we're doing between the OECD, Medin and, and, and GOOS, it's, you know, it's sort of some of the parts of the value chain there, and then having that sort of economic look at, at what's happening. So uh, uh, an important and fruitful partnership. So the other thing I want to look at is to take from where uh, Claire left off and have a little bit of a deeper look into those value chains. But first of all, uh, this image might be familiar to, to many of you. Um, it's, a, it's an image from the Ocean Observing System report card, just showing all of the, um, the global ocean observing networks, uh, the, the 12 networks that sit under the Observations Coordination Group. You know, there's something like 86 countries involved. There's almost now uh, 9,000 in situ observing platforms. So that's a lot of different sorts of data uh, flowing into to different data centers and this is really you know this is the, the system that was set up at least sort of early on for operational services and uh, for uh, climate but increasingly we now have the bioeco networks adding uh, more dimensity and, and complexity to that landscape so it, it's really vital to understand how the data is is being used i mean ocean data we we anticipate are um, no, are underpinning a wide range of applications. And you've, you've heard talk of the value chain from observations, be there from satellite or the, the, the global, regional and national observing systems that, that Goose coordinates through the data management, through analysis and, and models out through to services and applications under weather, uh, severe storm warnings and into ocean health and areas like this. But there's a kind of a big uh, caveat there so, and this is really where this relationship comes in. Um, the knowledge of the economic value of, of the services that, that ocean observations enable is, is scattered and not necessarily well defined. We, we lack a view of how uh, data is flowing through economies. And policymakers, therefore, uh, often lack the appropriate evidence base to, to guide and prioritize their investment. So, this is part of a work between GOOS and the OECD to look at better understanding of the socioeconomic benefits of ocean observations. And so this is 
kind of like the first step on a, on a pathway to understanding more about ocean data flow and the values in economies under underneath this uh, this partnership. So I'm going to go to more or less where where Claire left off. So I'm going to look at and say, you know, can we begin to see some patterns in this sort of data type use at across the sectors and we divided uh, sort of into five sectors, academia and research, um, commercial industry and consultancy, non-governmental organizations and other environmental agencies and government policy and maritime authority. And already you can begin to see some differences emerging in the types of data sets they're using. So I've said there are five core data sets. Um, these are because they're kind of used by almost all of these sectors. That's uh, physical oceanography in a sort of a, a browny green color, um, chemical oceanography in yellow, biological oceanography in a silvery gray, uh, marine geology, dark gray, and then human activities in a sort of a brown color. So academia and research, they're using all of these five sort of core data types. When we move into the commercial and industry and consultancy sector, marine geology and the human activities uh, appear to be more important there, um, but also physical oceanography and biological oceanography. In the non-governmental organizations, uh, you have a sort of, I guess, you know, an even split between the biological, the physical, and also the human activities sort of being joined together there. And this is kind of similar um, for the government policy and the maritime authority. Uh, they're also sort of using a similar set of, of, of data there. And interestingly, less of, of the chemical oceanography. And then when we look at the environmental agency in yellow, there, there's a lot of chemical oceanography data uh, being used, also the physical oceanography, and then uh, environment data as a sort of a, a, as, as, a, as an add in there. The only caveat being that the environmental agency response was quite small. So this is perhaps not a robust result, but it's interesting to be able to see some, some differences between the sectors emerging there. And then when you look down, as um, Claire indicated, or both Claire's indicated, uh, further into tracking the value chain, this is really saying, OK, so which uh, sort of what, what, what's your role? What, what sector do you work for? What sector are you working for? And then what action are you taking? And these are what we have here, these kind of um, value chain diagrams, let's call them, where we have the field of use on the on the right hand on the left hand side and the action taken on the right hand side and this is kind of first steps towards maybe a, a novel way of, of of looking at the the value chains and being able to track those in um uh, through through real data from the data centers so we can easily identify differences in the types of action that the data is informing across different sectors based on the kind of the the the, the number of responses there we can identify which actions are most frequently used for the data. We can identify the collections of actions that each field is engaging in. Is it broad or narrow? And are they not using data for, for some areas? So I'll have a look at a couple of examples and it, hopefully that will just kind of bring that to life a little bit. But I would encourage you to take a look at the paper and, and take a look at the, the information um, in the paper where there's a where there's a sort of more to sort of um, to get your teeth into. So looking at the commercial industry and consultancy sector, you can see that marine data is most used to inform operations and for planning decisions, for risk analysis, and also for validating data. And it's really great to see this validating data thing coming in. It's something that we've supposed for, for some time, but lacked a, a lot of evidence of. Um, we can also see distinct patterns between the fields of use. For example, offshore wind is using uh, the data to inform a, a larger range of decisions, that's in purple, um, than the uh, marine re renewable energy sector, which is using it for uh, mainly two, two areas uh, of decision making. So you begin to see these sorts of differences coming through. If we look at the uh, another uh, example, the government policy and maritime authority area. Here, marine data is in use to inform many different types of action, to conduct research and development for statutory reporting, which is also very important to see that use coming in, to manage marine resources for risk analysis and also, again, validating data. And then you can look at this and maybe perhaps, you know, confirm some uses, for example, um, for coast protection uh, here in, in orange again, 
the uses for risk analysis and for coastal planning that that might be expected it, it sounds reasonable but what 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 could they also be using the data for so we hear some echoes of um of these this value in in the benefit statements um, that we we gained we asked some qualitative questions in the survey as well and this would be some of the, the comments from within those, really sort of talking about essential to informing and supporting decision-making, providing authoritative data frameworks for validating the results, contributing to more efficient operations, eliminating or greatly reducing the need for costly on-site surveys. So these are all very positive statements and really the, the sort of statements that we, we would hope that uh, marine data is, is being used for, helping to avoid costs, really playing a role in, in, in the national economy and providing essential input to modeling. So this is uh, a, a short summary of some of the, the insight and some of the benefits um, I see from this data um, uh, at this first uh, survey to, to our communities, to the data in the ocean observing communities. It's a strong demonstration showing that the economic efficiency of a coordinated system, um, so that data being used in a wide range of areas beyond research, take once, use many. Um, it's showing clear cost savings uh, in validation, checking and reporting, et cetera, and is also of direct economic value. There's another question that we don't have time to show here, uh, which asked about revenue generating products. And there are a number of, um, responses uh, in that area. Um, so as Claire said, it provides the robust evidence about the users and the uses of the data. And I think it can indicate points of rupture in the value chain where we could compare, you know, actual value chains with what our expectations might be. And say data centers, uh, Medin and others could use this to foster dialogue with stakeholders, maybe address gaps in service and also inform their strategic direction. Um, it increases transparency around the value of the investment in the system as a whole. And I think it also highlights the importance of best practices and metadata as vital enablers of all of this downstream use. So the key findings, which you can obviously go to the report and, and read in more detail, they really talk about this complex marine data landscape. The users are accessing via many different routes and there's a diverse uh, marine data user base and a broad range of reasons that these uh, users visit the data centers and multiple industries in the UK's ocean economy are using this um, valuable marine data. From the recommendations, I'll perhaps follow up on something that um, Claire mentioned, uh, and it occurs it sort of as a recommendation for the institutional reporters and to the marine observing and data management community. And this is to perhaps look at creating communication strategies that really um, talk about and outline how these data are used and reused. And perhaps, I don't know, this webinar could be seen as a start of that, but I think we probably have to reach uh, quite a little bit further than, um, than, uh, than this webinar to, to really um, get people understanding um, you know what what we see in in this research and, and maybe we should have it as a as a as one of our our next steps as well but what i wanted to fi finish on is to say that this work is is ongoing as claire jolly uh at the start of this presentation mentioned we're going to expand the survey to other marine data centers uh you know are there similar or different data use patterns? Is there global or regional patterns? I, I think there's a lot of interesting results that we could get from uh, running several more of these surveys. We're also going to start um, in, in the next month or so, a, a piece of work to uh, do an, a review of the, uh, the best practices in valuation of ocean observation, or at least the papers written about the, the various practices. And from there, uh, develop recommendations for a best practice in the valuation of ocean observations and ocean systems, ocean observation systems. And from there, we hope to be able to build up a, a portfolio of cases using similar, uh, using the same methodology that will then become comparable and allow us to then track uh, that, that the value from observation through to uh, through to users. So it was just to say to watch this partnership for some more insight into this area. Um, 
and uh, to say thank you very much to, to the partners, to Medin and the OECD to, for working um, together on, on this project. So without more ado, I'll turn it back to Tosca for, um, for questions and answers. So thank you, Emma, Claire and Claire. Uh, well, I cannot provide the answers, but I can <laughs> questions. And there's happily enough, quite a few questions coming in. And I'm gonna start here with a question from uh, Lisa Miller. She basically asked if there is a significant industry that had been missed in a preconceived list of, of different industries that responded to the survey. And, and the reason she asked that, there was quite a few that responded other. Um, who would like to take that? Claire, Yoli? Sure, sure. Uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right, Lisa. We, we have quite a number of responses with other uh, indicated. Um, but as you can see in the actual paper, we included the full questionnaire also. Uh, with links to all the, uh, I would say, uh, taxonomies that we used throughout the questionnaire. So you'll be able to, to take a look at, at this. But in terms of trying to see whether we had missed a, a large industry or that there were maybe so, some industry that we should have also included that may, may not be major. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, what we will do for the next round of survey is definitely go back to the initial survey and maybe correct or open up an opportunity to actually include a few more uh, industries. The reason is that for the sake of this particular survey, we asked actors who were actually working with industry to include the top three industries that they were working with. So we believe statistically that there may be a small risk that a number of respondents actually clicked to the other because they didn't want to pick the top, the top three. So to make sure that we take this into account for the next survey, uh, we discuss this internally, we find a way to make sure indeed that this category other gets really smaller because we believe we identified really the larger industries that, uh, that could, you know, we would have been uh, uh, interested, I would say, in, in this particular work. I hope that uh, responds to your question. Thank you, Claire. Really good. Uh, I have a question here from Per Fitzek, and it basically asks, uh, are there any data types that you miss that the users are asking for? Uh, so it's a similar question, really, but more on the answer side than, than the question side. Uh, so who would like to answer that, Claire again? Claire. Well, I'll answer that, yeah. So, um, so this is really talking about were do the users do they want some data that's not available and that's a really tricky one to answer and it's not one that we specifically addressed with this um survey um it is one that we that within medin that we we do um inquire about quite frequently and and we try to fill the gaps um where we can so this this uh survey was specifically trying to look at the reuse of data from public repositories as opposed to what other data might it be really useful to collect? So no, we didn't capture it in this one, but it yeah, it, it could be something that we could address in further um, surveys. Something to consider. Emma's got an addition. Yeah, I, I would just add a small point because I know that um, Medin, uh, you know, keen to to use the data and perhaps to look at gaps in services and things, but. Um, when you look down the value chain and you can take a guess at where you think or I think a dialogue with the ocean observing community can also help identify where one would anticipate that data should be being used and if they're not being used for those decisions that might also help identify that maybe the right sort of data is not available in 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 some way just just a thought that that might be you could uncover that in other ways as well okay thank you so I take a question here from Cooper van Kraken, of Ranken, sorry. So are there any efforts to quantify the potential scientist response bias in the previous survey results? And I guess he is referring to the fact that about half of the respondents were working in, in, in science. Uh, and that might bias the, the results here. Have you look at that? Uh, 
Claire Jolly or Claire Hostelwald, both of you. <laughs> yes, go ahead and speak out. Claire, please go S start with this. So um, I guess the question was asked after I'd shown the, the quite so many scientists were responding. But then I hope when you then saw some of the plots that Emma presented, so although we didn't um, try to remove the bias or any bias explicitly, we did then go into much greater detail and looked um, what the different sectors um, were using or what data they were using. Um, so a bit of a mixed response. So no, we didn't remove the bias, but we did explore um, more broadly what was going on. Claire? I think that was an excellent response. <laughs> no, we were expecting many, many scientists to, to come in and, and, and respond uh, to the survey. But indeed, uh, when we did the data mining, that's when everything made sense. And, and, and indeed, uh, I think that we stand by the results, I believe. And, and we expected a little bit this large amount of, of, uh, of scientists uh, coming in and joining the survey. And I would also add that that was some of the reason for asking the questions about, you know, what, what is your role? Where do you work? But what sector are you working for? Because many scientists are working for other sectors. And so teasing out how, uh, you know, not just people's roles, but people's, uh, you know, where they're working and then what they're using the data for is, is a kind of, you know, important to try and to track how, how the data are being used. Very good. Thank you all for answering that question. I'm going to take a question from Sid first on from NOAA in the US. He's asking if OECD are having conversations with the WMO systematic observing finances facility soft to guide investment in the global basic serving network. So basically, you, is there any conversation based on this survey and others to guide the investment in the observing system? At this stage, no. We, we were really right now, uh, I have to say, uh, waiting for this event, the webinar in particular, the launch of this paper to see if there's interest uh, in the broader community, that we include obviously a WMO. But at this stage, we wanted to prove the concept uh, to see if the case study was working. We believe it does. Uh, with a bit of a tweaking, we're going to replicate this uh, in other parts of the world uh, and see you know, what, what, can, what can we uh, provide as support to other uh, organizations down the road. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we don't have a, a very large, large ambition to actually uh, conduct thousands of surveys, but we want to be really able to put together the evidence that's going to be directly used uh, by the organizations that work with us. And typically, uh, I believe UK Medin is in, in that case. So a conversation with WMO would definitely be uh, welcome. Uh, that was not done before. Step-by-step uh, -step approach, obviously. Thank you, Claire. Uh, that's good to see that there is some forward outlook on, on this. I take a question here from Peter Liss, also based in the UK, and he asked if there's any ambition to have a project to estimate the actual monetary value of marine observations, similar to the cost-benefit analysis recently conducted in the median when the ratio was one to eight. I might... Uh answer that one if yeah so um so the last slide showed sort of two parallel activities going forward and the, the kind of the early sort of design of some of the work um through discussions with the oecd was to track the flow of data in economies but then also work on the valuation of um the of ocean observations you know the, the valuation to in in terms of their impact on society and how we look at that how, how we can produce um, repeatable methods that, that many people can, um, can then, then use. So that's what you kind of saw at the end of that, the, uh, the tracking of um, this data flow through society gives uh, one window into the, into the issue, if you like, and gives us a lot of information and, and data, but we also need to work on some of the specifics um, but as you saw, the data are used in many different areas, so it's not going to be straightforward. You're not going to come up with one number very quickly. Um, so the first step will be to gain a, a best practice. 
um, and recommendations for that. And then the second step will be to start using that best practice as a, as a means of evaluating and build up a portfolio. So I, I guess, you know, there, there's two, two approaches we're taking here and bringing those pieces of data together and interplaying with each other, but it's not going to be I, I, it's going to take a little bit longer to come up with some of those answers. I think um, you know we, we, it, it's work of a of eighteen months or uh, two years. Claire, I don't know if you want to add anything on. To uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, again, you know, we're trying to build evidence, so we are extremely careful. <laughs> um, but we've come a long way as compared to five years ago, I believe. We are really starting to see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, I would say. And, and as we see more and more economists uh, joining the conversation, being aware of the intricacies of marine data, of the different ob observing systems, I think we're getting to a point where indeed over the next uh, a couple of years, uh, we may have something uh, of, of clear interest, I believe, to the, for the community. Very good, thank you. So if we have any questions, we will not be able to answer all of them in this live session, but we will respond to them by email because we have the list. But since we still have uh, quite some time, I'm going to take a question from Jay Perlman. And he asks, have other repositories done similar surveys? And if yes, how do they compare to these results? Yes, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to um, go back to the, uh, the Medin cost benefit analysis, which is a similar but not identical um, analysis. It's looking at the benefits and the costs of running a service to provide the data rather than the value of the data itself. And there are similar, um, some similar studies, not loads, but some similar studies there. Um, but no, this really is the starting point of a much, well, we hope a much wider study as, a, as, as Claire and Anna mentioned, looking for, for new partners um, to develop these further and, and take it further. Claire, did you want to add something? Yes, yeah, saying that uh, probably quite a number of, of data repositories have, have done their own um, surveys for their own needs. Uh, I, I hope they did, uh, most of, most of most of the large ones actually. But uh, I don't think that at this stage, uh, that type of survey has been conducted with the explicit objective of actually growing, creating value chains. Um, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't believe so. Not for marine data. So this is really why it was very experimental uh, from the start and it's not totally perfect. Uh, we do have, uh, as you will see in the paper, a number of caveats uh, technical notes here and there. Uh, we're again very careful on this, but we got some interesting results, I believe. Uh, and now it's going to be time to actually indeed try to replicate and, and add indeed uh, probably um, more, more uh, uh, substance on some of the um, economic realities of marine data. But at this stage, uh, Jay, we're still not putting together best practice uh, <laughs> specifically on this survey, but but, you know, as we grow the family of case study, uh, it's coming. So it's going to come your way, <laughs> an IOC's way. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Claire, for that answer. Um, I, I have a, qu a question here from uh, Dina Pakina, um, located in Brussels. How are you planning to confirm the success of the methodology and adapt it with lessons learned to spread it? to the best practice in other countries, so it's related to the other question. Will the target audience of this paper be consulted on the usefulness of the results for them? Uh, so is there any feedback to the respondents of the survey? So that's quite a long question. I, I could take a, a part of it. Um, and I, th I think that Claire Postlebright could take another, <laughs> Claire Jolly yet another. Um, so, so the survey at least was in part um, uh, 
forming part of the work under the Global Ocean Observing System 2030 strategy, which is to under, better understand the, the value chain, how data is, is getting to end users and start to work a little bit more on communicating on the, the value of data. And this will certainly fulfill that purpose. As Claire Jolly mentioned, it really is a, it's a start. We need more surveys for more robust use. So from a Goose perspective, I mean, we, we are the customer um, of, of this data in, in some senses. And I think um, as probably indicated by the PowerPoint that I think it has a lot of interesting and useful data for the ocean observing community and for Goose itself in, in, in working and communicating about the use of um, ocean data that will only be strengthened by as we sort of continue and, and take this work a little bit further because it really is robust and evidence-based. But I'll pass on to, to Claire Postlethwaite maybe to answer for, for your users. Thank you, Emma. I was just, uh, the question has disappeared from my screen, but I, I, it was about feedback to, to the, well, I think it was to the contributors or of, to the survey, but it could also have been to the uh, recipients of the report, which are, are two slightly different um, audience. So it's certainly um, in terms of the, um, the audience who completed the survey, um, we'll, we'll, within Medin we'll be um, providing lots of feedback uh, across the data centers, but much more broadly as well um, on how useful the report is. And that will um, feed back to OECD and Goose um, so that although the UK involvement is, is uh, ramping down, then um, it can inform the, the projects going forward. Um, in terms of the um, audience for the actual report, I'll pass over to Claire Jolly about how feedback can be incorporated um, from that. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, at this stage, uh, you know, we published this paper uh, and we indeed uh, expect some feedback, uh, some questions. Uh, I've seen quite a number of questions in the Q&A here. Uh, so we'd be happy to take on any suggestions also to make this even uh, more, I would say, useful down the road for the uh, ocean observing community and the marine um, data uh, archiving centers. Uh, so this is now in the public domain. We do have a lot more data uh, from the survey itself, but that's only accessible to our colleagues from, from Medin uh, and Goose. But that means really that uh, we really at the first stage of actually really building up this exercise. So any comments from stakeholders, uh, people reading the paper would be very welcome. Thank you very much, Claire. I, for me, reading this paper, I was really fascinated that the data on human activities was the second most demanded data type. And that is something that Goose doesn't currently really respond to at all, even though it's an ambition to increase that human impact variables. That is, a, you know, I think we should have more con, uh, discussions on what, what kind of human activity data really asked for. And, and that's a very interesting response for me. But I'm not supposed to ask the question, so I will actually go back to a question from Adriane Sunuddin, who asks, what would be most common or viable development sector which can drive the demand for marine data and help country or certain areas to invest in operational ocean observations? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. So which is the most common and viable development sector that can drive the investment in ocean observations? Do we have any indications from this survey what that could be? So if I may, um, actually, yes. that's why it's going to be so interesting for us to have different case studies, because we believe it may vary uh, depending where you are, uh, depending on the, the, the type of ocean sectors that are actually developing in different countries. So we may see, indeed, uh, uh, great variations, uh, whether you're a small coastal country, whether you're a very large um, a country with very large ports, uh, it, we believe it may vary really 
And that's where it's, it's quite interesting to actually draw the value chain so that we can take a look at who's actually using uh, the data. Um, I have to say, when we found out the data about the offshore wind sector in the UK, we were so excited <laughs> because really uh, we believed uh, and we were able to see that um, this use of marine data, not only for uh, operational purposes, but also just to actually put together your uh, offshore wind platform at sea, you need a lot of marine data. That's so obvious, but now we do have actually the evidence. So we believe that we can find a few uh, surprises or uh, more evidence for some well-known sectors uh, if we conduct that type of case study in other places. So I know it's not a perfect answer, but uh, well, like everybody else, we need more data. Just, oh. Sorry, go ahead and, and uh, comment. I'll just add to that specifically around the offshore wind sector. So within the UK, um, there's been significant involvement from the Crown Estate who own the seabed around the UK and um, are they've been pivotal in uh, encouraging or insisting that offshore wind developers make their marine data openly available. And that interaction between Medin and um, that sector has really, um, I think, supported um, both the ability for that data to be made available, but also um, to encourage that sector to reuse existing data. So I think it, um, and then going back to the original question, um, whatever activity is being encouraged, if you have that uh, conversation about making data openly available right from the start of a new industry or a new development that can really help um, generate additional data and also data use. Thank you, Claire. I, I think that's clear. If there is a requirement and demand and a, and a customer for this data, it's actually not that expensive to implement. Some, some data gathering device on, on infrastructure like that. So that's a good comment. We are nearing half, you know, the one hour. Um, I would like to take one more question, but then I, I, I think that we can stay on for a few more minutes, realizing that some of you have other commitments. But I, I think that Angel um, Munisila Inyanila had a really good question that is uh, going to give you the opportunity to go around the room here. So what was the most fascinating results or conclusion that you got from this study? A very easy to answer. And so I, I, I will start now with Claire Jolly to answer that in the order that you gave your presentation. What was the most exciting result from your point of view, Claire? Uh, the, the most, well, first, I, I really have to say we were very happy that it was working. <laughs> the process is working. We can, we can elicit uh, good responses that help us put together a value chain. So that the concept is working is already wonderful. Uh, we were not sure. Uh, we hoped, we really, really hoped. And uh, again, here, I have to say, one of the key inputs in this is really um, the support from Medin, obviously, and from the DAX, from the data archiving centers. Uh, without this support, uh, we would not be able to access the users. So this is, I would say, maybe just one, one point here that I really want to stress. For future case study, that's going to be very important, this close collaboration with the data repositories. Maybe I could let my, my colleagues take this on. Thank you, Claire, Claire Postler White. What was the most exciting outcome? Okay, I'm going to go for, fast, for exciting and fascinating. So the most exciting area was that last slide that I showed because that's that's very new and that's uh, for each data type, each specific data type. So ocean currents was the one I showed. Just the range of um, actions that are taken with that data and just having that evidence to demonstrate that. So that's my most exciting. Uh, my most fascinating was the number of people that are accessing marine data for their hobby. Yes, a very good hobby to access marine data. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be interesting to see what kind of hobbies they have and what they're using their data for. Uh, so Emma, what is your take home results? So I will answer 
um, in looking at the, the value chains that which I kind of featured in in parts of my presentation. These for me are the most fascinating and whether or not we got the kind of the segmentation of those sectors right. But being able to see that the data was being used for this variety of decision making and different decision making things in, in, in different industries and different sectors. I, for me is really important and it kind of also answers a second question from Arthur Capet, which is, you know, uh, how, do, how do you see, um, see that value is being created? Now, every time somebody is using the data from these um, repositories and reusing that data to, to make decisions, this is creating value in an economy, uh, be it cost savings or to inform decisions sort of around planning and things like this. This is direct evidence of creating value in an economy. And so these were the most, these were the fascinating thing because it begins perhaps to enable you to uh, see um, some sort of level of, of market segmentation. So Claire uh, Postlethwaite was really excited on the, on the product side, which is where is all my products being used, but I'm interested also in, in the range of products that are being used by segments, because if you want to really communicate and, uh, have support, let's say, for sustained observations from uh, from society and from industry, you're, you're going to be able to need to identify those segments that are really using the data, what they're using them for, and having that, that dialogue. And so you need some, the beginning of that market segmentation, but we need more data. So, so thank you very much, the panelists and the audience <laughs> for this one hour of webinar. We are now past the one hour mark, so uh, the seminar is closed, but <laughs> I think Claire and Claire and Emma agreed to stay on for a few more minutes and, and take some more questions and, and have a more of a discussion. And so I, I, I invite you all to stay on or to go to your other meetings and your other duties. I have a question actually to, to well, I think Claire Jolly mostly, most of this, the, the, the use of the data called was used by scientists. How do you really value, put the monetary value of, of data that's been used by a scientist to produce the scientific results, as opposed to in, in, in a, a data set that is used for operations or guiding an investment in marine infrastructure? How can you do that? And how can that be kind of, way similarly in, a, in an analysis like this? Well, you know, many of the scientists that responded to the questionnaire are not working for universities. Quite a few are actually working for different industries or are working also for uh, actually even research centers that are producing um, products, commercial products. Mm. That's something that we found out also. So when you actually track uh, via the different questions that we asked, um, the occupation of the person, uh, the sector in which the person is working, the type of, act of actions that are taken then later on with the data, you can actually um, yeah, get to a value, some sort of value. It may not be sometimes a monetary value, uh, unless it's a productivity gain, it can be also an efficiency gain, but you can actually indeed estimate some values, uh, even in a qualitative way, um, that can be actually quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. So you never value data based on the occupation of the person. You can be a scientist, that's fine, but you actually really value the action that has been taken with the data at the end of the day. I hope that helps. So, so, so by, by classifying these responses in, in a diff, rather in the sector rather than the, the occupation would give a different result. Absolutely. The sector, I, and also the field of application and the mm -hmm. action that has been taken with the data. Oh, that's a very good point. But if I reformulate my question and say, how can you evaluate the use of data by a university scientist doing basic research in that context? Ha -ha. Then you go into some uh, qualitative issues, but you can also sometimes, you know, put a monetary value. But but that's uh, that's why we still have some work to be done because we need to make sure 
that whatever we come up with is actually uh, und understandable and uh, acceptable to everybody. So you, you will rarely see the OECD put a dollar figure or a euro figure uh, easily. We really need time to actually come up with something that's actually credible. Hence, you know, the evidence building. I hope that helps a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's, that's very good. I'm trying to read on the questions at the same time here. No, I think these are, these are interesting and, and I'm looking forward to see some results on, on, on that. Not just the value chains, but also the actual value for the observing system is important to demonstrate the value of the data. And actually nobody's interested in observations, the interest in data and really the knowledge and the information that comes from this data. So, I, well, you know, if you stay on a few more minutes here, I, there's a question from um, Beam Duncan. Is there any thoughts on future ambitions to look into how many end users require multidisciplinary data? That is data collected together, but covering multiple categories. Um, maybe a difficult question to answer, but maybe you have some idea. Uh, I'll, I'll um, try on that one. Um, so I, I think Graham's unfortunately left the, the meeting now, but I can get back to him separately. Um, so at the moment, Medin is exploring ways to apply a standard to um, application programming interfaces, so data from different data centers can be uh, recollected and, and served in the same way. So this, this would allow, so this is exploring new technology to allow um, multidisciplinary data sets to be accessed at the same time, but it's an ex exploration. So that's, that's where the ambition lies at the moment. Yeah, I can personally imagine that very many ask for physical oceanography data to support biological, chemical, oceanography data, and other data. That, so that's maybe why the physical oceanography data is coming very high on, on the list there. Any, any more comments on that, Emma? I was just going to comment that I, you know, this, this question has come up in a, in a sense in a different way uh, in the observing system. And I would just highlight the importance of metadata, um, that metadata is really vital to the downstream use and the, the there's some work going on with the observation coordination group and the uh, the various sort of global ocean observing networks looking at sort of uh, setting kind of basic uh, metadata cross network standards and then reaching out down a little bit down the value chain uh, and saying what what do users really need in the metadata because it, it is also you know can be a little bit focused on you know what what what's needed internally. And this area has come up as a, a discussion that I've been involved in you know, previously about having in, this, in the metadata somehow nearby or, or you know, this cruise collected all these other things as well or whatever, when it's not necessarily obvious to other people once the data has gone on its different pathways. And I think this is, a, it's an interesting point. I'll try and store it for... For, for later application, but it is a, it is a good point to bring up. Mm. Thank you, Emma, for, for bringing the attention to the importance of metadata and, and, and the FAIR principles to findable, accessible, reusable uh, uh, data, uh, which is really about, uh, and, and I guess there is a whole technical discussion there, Claire Foster White, on how, how data centers can, can make the data FAIR. And, and I would say that's, you know, that's what, what uh, that perhaps we should be, be having a discussion on this indeed, because it's, uh, it's something that uh, is certainly in the kind of the, the mind of the observation coordination group at the moment. So, mm. yeah, that's, that's Medin's vision that all UK marine data are fair. Yeah. Yes, I think that would be, a, well, at least one whole other webinar, <laughs> several, I would say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so very good. So we are 10 minutes past now, and uh, I, I think we're going to close the webinar. And I would like to thank the panelists, Claire Jolly, Claire Postle-White, and Emma Heslop for a very interesting presentations and, and guiding uh, the answers to, this, to the questions from the audience. And thank you all for listening and tuning into this, to this webinar. And let me remind you that the, uh, this recording is available on the GOES website. To, to listen to again or to recommend to your friends and colleagues.
And I wish I hope that we will see each other again on another Goose webinar. Thank you very much.